Hello, Blenders, and welcome to episode number 199 of Real Blend, a podcast that has to change its pick for Judy Dench Blend. My name is Sean O'Connell, the managing editor here at Cinema Blend. And uh, on this week's show, we have a trailer for... <laughs> Thank you, just, Kevin. I, I just got that. It took me like 15 seconds. Kevin. Yes, it was. A uh, trailer <laughs> for Moon Knight is here. Uh, we have the title for Amazon's Lord of the Rings series. And then guys, guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, uh, later on in the show... The Radio Silence guys are back on Real Blend so soon after coming on to talk about Scream, but this time we have them back to discuss full-on spoilers. And so, uh, to protect most of you, uh, we're putting this at the end of the show because we don't want anyone to stumble into it by accident. You haven't seen Scream yet, but if you have seen Scream, and a lot of you guys have seen it up to this point, this is the conversation uh, that you guys want to listen to. It is chock full of incredible, incredible behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, in terms of the making of of Scream and continuing this franchise. Um, joining us, as always, Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. I still feel bad for leaving Kevin out uh, of last week's <laughs> introduction. I re-listened to that. Actually, I watched it on the YouTube and I was watching Kevin's face when he was like, I didn't get introduced. <laughs> 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 Just felt like, felt like high school. No, no, no. I... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, good to see you guys, uh, and I can't wait for people. If you've seen Scream, you gotta just make sure you listen to this interview. There are some insane yeah. stories in there. We actually yeah. just recorded it just before this recording of the show, so like it's we're kind of so like good. coming off of it. So uh, if it's you, gonna if be the you most you've Scream, ever been excited over an ear. You're gonna you're gonna find out something about an <clears throat> ear, and you're gonna just die. It's it's the, it's, the, it's it's the craziest thing I've ever heard about an ear. That is the voice of a uh, belated birthday boy, Jake Hamilton. Hey! Who is uh, 34, is that correct, 34. Jakey? 34. 34 years young. 34. Huh? I, was, I was 12 when we started this podcast. <laughs> uh, coincidentally, I was 34. <laughs> it's been a really long time since then. Uh, listen, housekeeping, if you're watching us on YouTube. Um, hello, thanks for joining us. Go down, hit subscribe, turn on notifications. Share the link to this week's episode with a friend. Uh, we found out that a lot of people are passing us around and um, and growing the the audience. We can't uh, tell you guys how much we appreciate that. Um, of course, we are available all the other places where you get your podcast needs met. And uh, I want to talk about the Real Blend Premium. But first, uh, I want to throw it to Gabe for some really special announcements regarding our upcoming episode 200. Gabe, take it away. Yes. Us, so so this is episode 199, as you may have heard at the top of the show. Gabe, what, which... what comes after 199? Episode 200 is next week. Uh, it'll be dropping on January 28th. Um, and we wanted to do something fun. There's a lot of fun stuff that, that in particular, um, people who watch us on YouTube will see some fun new things. Um, there'll be a fun shift in format. We're going to move some things around, add some fun stuff. Um, I'll let that be that. But if you want to do um, participate and have a little extra fun, we're going to throw a quote unquote after party on Instagram live um, on the evening of the 28th. Uh, the episode will drop at the usual time in the morning, um, but at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, we are going to be on Cinema Blend's uh, Instagram channel live, all four of us uh, to hang out with you all. Um, and we'll, we'll answer questions. Maybe we'll have a game or something, you know, put together. Uh, it'll be kind of casual. It won't be as cool as a meetup. It won't be as cool as, you know, getting a drink and, and, um, shooting the shit as they say, but we hope that it'll be fun. Um, and we're excited to see you. I don't know if it goes well, maybe, maybe we'll do this more often. Maybe we won't need 200 episodes to, to do that. Also, do I don't know if, uh, he's revealed this yet, but Jake's going to get a tattoo during live. the Instagram live. live. Another, yeah. another tattoo. Another tattoo. Yes. It's a Barb and yeah. Star tattoo, right? No, no, it's I've actually. Got, well, it's a, I've got like Kevin's face on one side of my chest, and yes. I've got Gabe's face on another. So I don't know what mm -hmm. to do next. I don't know. Edgar's who prayer on what on the right butt cheek. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> right, kind of so. Kinda. In all seriousness, episode two hundred next week, we're <laughs> gonna throw a fun little after party on Cinema Blend's Instagram Live. Um, so be sure to follow Cinema Blend, um, and if you follow the guys, it should pop up when they join. Hop into the chat. Uh, we'll, we're gonna open it up to questions. And we'll hang out and have some fun. This is going to be a lot of fun. I think so. Right, we're going to have a good time. Yeah. Can I drink during it? It'll be a Friday, too, yes. which is cool. All right. Yes. That's kind of what I was thinking. Like, it's a happy hour kind of, you know, time. And we'll 
Maybe play some games. Jake can beat Jake can beat the listeners in games instead of beating <laughs> the hosts Ooh. this time. Um, okay, so the weekly poll, which I'm going to throw to Jacob this time, uh, and I I asked this question because I I kind of suspected this, and uh, and the results are a little bit concerning for this reason. The question was. What's the next movie that is going to bring you out to theaters? Knowing that Spider-Man No Way Home did really well, and then Scream did really well, um, the, the the offerings for the end of January and early February are slim-ish, let's put it that sure. way. Uh, yeah. Morbius moved, but uh, I included Jackass, which is coming, uh, Uncharted, which is a February release, and then I went as far as The Batman, which is a March release, and in uh, fourth place I put Other. Uh, yeah. And we'll talk about that in a second. Jakey, where do you think the people went for the I'm next movie Batman. that's going to bring them out to theaters? That's got to be the Batman. Batman. Yeah. The Batman, 62%. Um, other, I saw a lot of Doctor Strange into the Multiverse of Madness, which to me, this is why I'm saying this is concerning. Um, but do people lot... realize that got pushed back? I think they do. I think that like they're okay with the next movie they see in theaters being being May. But Batman, um, and though. I don't know if that's a slate of, you know, just a, a, a commentary on the offerings or how people feel about potentially going back to theaters. I, I, I'm still trying to figure out where we are in terms of this. I think there's some people who probably also feel that the Batman might be available on streaming. They don't realize yet that it's not going to be on HBO Max this year. And I've heard a lot of people say like, oh, I can't wait to watch Batman on, on HBO Max. And uh, that's not going to be the case. But... Do you think the Batman, like, this is a strange question because I'm, I'm super excited about it and I love Matt Reeves. Is there an element to being too dark? Nope. Oh, that's I'm interesting. I'm talking about visually, from a, from a perspective of, like, trailers. Right. Because, like, like, I think the idea of that it looks like Seven, as people have pointed out, like, there's a very dark and gritty tone to it. I'm very excited about it, no question. that you, you know, Giacchino, I'm all in. There's no question about that. I'm just wondering, like, do you do you get a vibe that it might be a little too dark in tone? Um, Interesting for some people. I don't know. I'm very. I'm just. I, I don't know. I'm feeling for that a casual weirdness. audience. You're saying for like a yeah. for a more mainstream yeah. audience. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, look, the, we've talked at length on this show about DC's problem. You know, to compete with what Marvel has figured out how to do, and Marvel has figured out the the jokier, uh, you know, more audience friendly type things and we'll talk about the moon knight trailer in a second but somebody brought up a really interesting point about that trailer uh that they like it didn't end on a joke it didn't end, the trailer didn't end on a little punchline and mm-hmm. they were shocked because that's such the marvel formula you know sure. that like after all the action you end on something that oscar isaac says it's really funny yeah. kind of thing and it didn't have it and they were sh- stunned about that kev I, kev I think it's an interesting question but i i think word of mouth if it's extremely positive is going to sure. power people to it regardless yeah so i just think like even even far from home got into super dark territory i mean clearly mm-hmm. it did um i just there's a there's a you know it's another batman film a new batman's playing batman it's like i just wonder like there are people and that one of the things we discussed in our show last week i think sean you're the one who said it like we had like oversaturation of batman which i don't necessarily disagree uh, uh, agree with because i feel like you know, you can say that about any superhero or any, uh, huh. you know, movie. That yeah, are out I now. read the comments underneath our YouTube channel <laughs> where everybody was pointing out that the Spider-Man fan is calling Batman oversaturated. Fair but, enough. Fair I mean, enough. I, I'm all in for it. I just it is such a dark trailer. And I, I just I just I just wonder aesthetically if that affects it all. The where where people I don't know. I, I don't know I if I know the what I'm apes saying. Movies are kind of dark. The apes yeah. movies are pretty heavy. In terms of mm-hmm. what they get into, especially the the last one was the last one War War of the Planet of the War. Apes. That was Matt's Reeves' movie. That was, yeah. that was a rough movie as well. That's too. what I'm wondering. So, Is it too yeah. heavy for right now? I don't know. We shall see. Uh, let's get to the Moon Knight trailer, uh, which had its debut during the uh, playoff football game, which was not much of a playoff football game at all. So, kind of after that halftime, I, I uh, punched out on it. I am a Marvel fan, obviously. I know a lot about Moon Knight. I, I I don't think you guys do. Do you guys are you guys familiar with the Moon Knight character at all? I'm not. I'm not. Good. Good. Then I want to hear what you guys thought about the trailer because I, we haven't even talked about this in the text thread. Did it get you interested no. at all in the show, Jake? Are you curious about who this character is? Are you uh, yeah. not on board? What do you think? I mean, I think the, the the number one reason I'm on board is because of Oscar Isaac. Um, I love him as an actor. Um, he seems really mm-hmm. enthusiastic about this character. 
uh, and that that excites me. Yeah, the, the the concept is intriguing. I think he looks interesting. Um, I saw some some pictures of what he looks like in, in, in the comics versus uh, what he ended up looking like in the show. Yeah, I'm intrigued. I'm, I'm a little thrown off by the British accent. I, I'm hoping uh-huh. in the show. Uh, when you just when I just hear it in its entire, I know anything taken out of context can can throw someone off. So I don't want to like judge judge. And it's not that I necessarily think that his accent is bad. It's just not what I'm used to hearing coming out of Oscar Isaac. So it's taking me a hot second to kind of get used to it. Um, that was sort of the only thing where I kind of had to like pause and go, wait, what's happening? Um, but hmm. no, I mean I'm sold. I mean I, I I don't think the trailer did anything to like you know turn turn the knob in terms of like you know upping my excitement a little bit uh, i'm about sort of exactly where i was before i saw the trailer it's kind of like okay cool but it didn't turn it down which is good okay kev how about you you've been a little bit hot and cold in terms of the marvel shows <laughs> yeah i mean at the end of the day i'm i don't again this goes back to the quote-unquote oversaturation conversation we were just having um i don't necessarily love the marvel series except for loki to be honest mm. with you, um, WandaVision promisingly, start, promisingly started out, you know, the first three episodes I love. I didn't like it after that. Wasn't a fan of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You know, I didn't even finish Hawkeye. Uh, and that's, you know, that's not really I can't really um, give you my critic critique of that because I didn't finish it. I just wasn't sure. interested enough to finish it is my point. Um, and I just I don't know. I mean, Oscar Isaac is my selling point here. I mean, I think the guy just chooses incredible and interesting work. I mean, clearly Dune, um, even with the card counter, even if the film wasn't great, I just find that he's making some very interesting choices I'm inside Lewin mm-hmm. Davis. Obviously, he he is a fascinating actor. I rewatched Annihilation recently. He's great in that. Um, so I think in my mind, I'm thinking about Oscar Isaac choosing to do this and going, is this good? And I feel like Oscar Isaac is on some level where he looks at the material, doesn't take it for a paycheck. Um, so in all honesty, like that's the one reason why I'm interested is the fact mm-hmm. that he's involved. And I think that every choice he's made so far as an actor, whether the movie was great or not so great, has been interesting to me. And I've found his path kind of like Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, I've always found his choices to be fascinating too. And I, I, I'm kind of, in, you know, I would love it. Dr. Strange series, obviously, but the, you know, they're not going to do that with the main, I guess they would do it with the main characters. I don't know. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know how they determine who gets a movie and who gets a show. You know, yeah, like, is it like a, is it like a, cause, cause the, like Wanda's a big character. And so obviously, sure. so is, is, is vision, but, and Falcon and Winter Soldier, but you're not seeing an Iron Man series. You're not seeing a cap series or I guess. Uh, yeah, it's a cap. Series. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, technically, Falcon, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Falcon and the Winter yeah. Soldier is a cap series. Um, yeah, but it's yeah, it's true. Yeah, good point. So this is the point where I'm going to bring up Ethan Hawke uh, telling us in his uh, interview, which you can hear on Real Blend, that uh, he a little bit went over to Marvel just because that's where the game is being played right now. Uh, and I hope that it's more so the material also. Uh, he did talk very highly about his experiences with them over there and said he enjoyed what they were doing. But this brings up a larger point that I kind of wanted to bring up in terms of are we getting to a point with the Marvel shows and the Star Wars shows, the Disney Plus shows in general, the streaming shows, where the um, the two biggest franchises currently operating right now, which would I would I would argue is Marvel and, and Star Wars that are doing a lot of their stuff on television. Um, I'm losing interest in them a tad. Um, not I'm more invested in the Marvel stuff because I do care about those characters. Um, but I'm, I'm coming over to Kevin's side in that there wasn't the urgency, you know, when a new episode of Hawkeye dropped, mm-hmm. I was like, I'll watch it. That's I cool. didn't even finish it. And neither of you finished it. And, mm-hmm. and I'm a little bit at the point with the Boba Fett show now where I'm two episodes that have passed that I haven't, there's one that dropped today. I haven't seen it and I haven't seen the one previous to it. And each time I'm on the couch and I'm, I'm like, should I, I'm just not that compelled to do it. So I don't, I'm. Are we getting to a point where they're turning out so many of these shows that and because it's free and it's right there and if you want to watch it, you can. But if you don't want to, it's easier to skip. How do you guys feel about that? I would argue that aside from Loki, do any of these shows have any ramifications in the story world of the movies? And I understand that they exist. Wanda does for sure. Yeah, but 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 do you would you have had to watch all of WandaVision to understand a story point that could have been explained in I, the beginning of a movie? I, I think Multiverse of Madness is going to explain like 
WandaVision in two lines. Yes, I, I, right. I don't think, right. I, I think that that's what they're playing is, and I think, I think the Multiverse of Madness will sort of set that stage because everything up to this point hasn't really touched on, on the series. Um, but I do think, I do think that they're going to have to make it interesting for people who aren't going to watch the series. Like it yeah, has sure. to make sense for people who are just watching the movies because <laughs> That's the they've got this massive audience. They don't just have giant Marvel fans. They have, you know, mom and pops who go to three movies a year and they they go to they go to the Marvel movies and they're not going to get a Disney Plus subscription just to watch more Marvel shows necessarily. Yeah. So don't you feel like the movies are a list and the shows seem more B list? Yes. And I'm not and yes. I don't I don't mean that I don't mean that badly because I, I just feel like at the end of the quality. day, if you're really going to make a great movie out of a great story with great story points yeah. that, f that change the universe you're going to put it into a movie i, this I is feel why, like the shows kind of get the 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 scraps this is why i think you guys are sleeping on hawkeye and why i really like hawkeye is because okay. hawkeye is not trying to to break open the marvel universe it's a i've said this before on the show it feels like a one-off it, it, it introduces characters and it sets the stage for things to come the characters are great in it the actors who are portraying them are doing a class work um, but the story but I'm not itself. Interested enough in Hawkeye to watch a whole series on. But my, my point is, I, I think your perspective that you're that you're coming to them is not unfair, but it's just it's it's your expectations are too high. Like Hawkeye is a a story about can Dad make it home for Christmas in time? It's a Christmas story. Can Dad make it home for Christmas? But the problems that he's trying to navigate to get home for Christmas are Hawkeye problems, and that's fun. And I think if you just go into them of like I just want to spend more time with the character, spend more time with the characters, mm -hmm. then you'll enjoy it. But if if you're not interested in the character, then yeah, I would say don't, then don't watch it. Because I think the series themselves are just there to either introduce new characters or give interesting stories for the characters that already exist. For sure. It's a level of investment as well, too. Because like, yes, right. you're right. Um, you might not care who Kate Bishop is, right? Like H Haley Steinfeld could show up in the next whatever movie and you might for, for five minutes be like, well, who is this character? But you would go along with the story kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But if you are invested in the in the world, you want to see her origin story. You want to see, and it just happened to play out in a television show, necessarily. Uh, Sean, I do want to ask you, because you know this character more than anybody, um, am I reading too much into it that if they, it's coming out at the end of February, if they do the two-episode release, and then weekly, it's leading right up to Doctor Strange's release, are there any, is there any way that those characters interact, or that those and stories the interact? The Moon Knight one? And end of Moon Knight. Moon Knight will end. No, I don't think so because originally when you, well, well, that's hard because there have been so many rewrites for Doctor Strange, but Doctor Strange was supposed to come out originally before Spider-Man No Way Home. Yeah. Yeah. So unless they are reworking the beginning of, of Doctor Strange to fit the Moon Knight deal. Um, and look, they could be doing that. That could be what the reshoots are for. Yeah. But um, no, I don't think they have to. I think, think they can around. operate. I think, you know, I think that that sounds very similar to when everybody was like, ooh, Spider-Man's swinging over Rockefeller yeah. Center in the snow. He's going to be in the Hawkeye finale. And I'm sure the showrunners are like, we can't do that. Like, that's and impossible the, to plan. The, the, so. la the last thing I wanted to run by you, because I don't totally know this character, but I saw people online talking about it, is the potential for Kit Harington's character from Eternals to show up in this storyline. Um, I mean, he doesn't in the Moon Knight comics, but that's not out of the realm okay. of possibility. Okay. I saw sure. people kind of pitching that as as that character coming in, because what's interesting about this series is that there's no there's seemingly no overlap of like an existing character where right. like every other series has had their Wanda or their Loki or their. Well, Falcon. that's but OK. So just to bring this up really quickly, like PJ watched the Moon Knight trailer and he is like, they recast that guy already. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, I thought this is who Kit Harrington is supposed to play at the end of Eternals. And I'm like, no, that's Black Knight. And this is Moon Knight. And and then yes. I just saw PJ's eyes glaze over. <laughs> <He was like. laughs> so there's, listen, there's confusion, uh, even on people who pay attention beyond a surface level. Yeah, right. uh, he was like, I thought that this guy picked up a sword in the end of Eternals. And I was like, no, this is a different guy. So uh, we'll see how it plays out. I'm um, talking about people who are glancing over or eyes are glazing over because of a... Uh, relative disinterest in the franchise um jake i'm going to pass it to you to discuss your anticipation level for amazon's the lord of the rings the rings of power i mean you know i i will say i am excited they announced um that i well one the title is terrible it's a horrible horrible title um but what if they uh, just called it rings of power would that be that's okay? what it should be okay 
Um, because basically, my understanding is is that the plot of this series is going to be sort of what the prologue of Fellowship was. That first 10 minutes where Kate Blanchett is sort of doing the voiceover narration and, expl- and is explaining the dispersion of the rings and how they went to the different people. Um, and that's basically what this show is going to be. I think that's interesting because now I don't really, aside from... Um, you know, that that opening 10 minutes of Fellowship, I don't really know the details of that story and what happened. So it'll be nice to, to watch a show and not know every single beat whenever they announced that this was going to be a series. It was sort of like, well, I, I know what happens. Like, why am I mm. going to give you eight years of my life to tell me a story that I already watched before? Sure. So in that sense, it's going to be great. Um, Amazon is pumping. Did I read somewhere like nearly a billion dollars, like a billion with a B into, yes. this, into this show? I read it a was lot. the most expensive TV show ever made. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like literally, literally excited to actually see it. Um, yeah. You know, cool. Let's let's uh, let's support Jeff Bezos. Things things, you know, he needs he needs. Uh, he needs Does Amazon just not have Jeffrey Bezos like they like they need a place to dump money. <laughs> Is that really like a billion dollars? On a He's show? laundering money like, on like, like, the weirdest money laundering, laundering scheme ever. He literally has no other place to put all of his money. I did walk uh, up to Jeff Bezos one time at a, a Star Wars premiere and I said, "Thank you for Amazon Prime." I did that. Did happen? <laughs> that is the thing that actually happened. I do like Amazon Prime. It's great. No, there's nothing. It's terrific. <laughs> I said, "Thank you." You can get stuff delivered the same day if you ordered early enough. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, we if are I not had sponsored seen, by Amazon in any way, shape, or form. If I had seen Bo Burnham's Inside, I would have started singing Jeffrey Bezos to him. Kevin, what did you love about the title treatment? You love the the fact that they did this all practically. practically. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the first of all, the, the title's bad, unfortunately, and I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and it makes me sad to say that. Um, I, you know, I'm... After the Hobbit films, which I didn't hate as much as everybody else did, I'm kind of... I kind of, in a weird sense of, like, I love the... Jackson's original trilogy so much that I don't know that there's more of it that I need. Um, that being said, I love the first three so much that I'm 100% grateful to go back into the world. Um, in terms of the title treatment that you guys are talking about, there's the trailer that came out today. It's like they're pouring the, um, what do you call that? Molten, I don't know, what do you call uh, it? Molten lava or whatever To that create stuff is. the rings, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they did it practically because weirdly enough, I would argue it almost looks CG in the final product, but then when they show you the behind the scenes that they use like this phantom flex camera, this 4K phantom flex camera that would like swing down as they were pouring it and they were like washing yeah. water to make this like smoke. Um, the behind I'm, the scenes footage is even cooler than the yeah. actual release. I'm um, honestly curious yeah. if they released that footage just because they, they saw the product and they were like, this doesn't even look real. Like yeah. we need to let people know that we, we made this. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't see like the behind video, the scenes I think, thing. I don't want to plug another site, but I think IGN had the video. IGN think, had uh, the exclusive, yeah. yeah. And like it's it's crazy because they cut back and forth between the final product and then the filming and the final product looks so CG. And I'm like, what happened here? They did all this really cool, like sweeping camera work and like really pouring it in. And and it it just it kind of was like made me upset. I was like, how did all that work went into (laughs) it? It looked looked, looked like a computer generated effect. So, um, I mean, I'm I'm, of course, I'm going to watch it. I'm just I don't know how I feel about it yet because I'm so. I thought like I was sitting here thinking I wanted more Lord of the Rings content. Like I, yeah. I love the original trilogy and Hobbits were fine. Um, but I'm just kind of like, I've kind of moved on from that, but mm. you know, I'll dive back into Tolkien's world. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm down. Well, I'm here to say that I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm back on board with this. Uh, as someone who doesn't necessarily love this franchise, of course you are. I'm going to give it a shot. Well, what I'm saying is I'm going to give it a shot. So so you, so, so you watch three of the greatest films of all time, and you're right. like, no, thank you. You, you like watch them. a trailer where molten lava is, is rolling around on some wood, and you're like, I'm sold. I'm in. I didn't, no, no, no. I didn't say I was sold. But what I'm saying is I'm, I'm behind the idea of fans of a franchise carrying on the legacy uh, beyond... Like, I'm glad it's not Peter Jackson, right? I'm glad, in a way, because I think... We needed a fresh voice. We needed a new voice to come in and maybe try to adapt these. Listen, I know that you're. Yeah, I know, Gabe. That's it I'm actually makes leaning no towards something. sense what you're saying. Like you're, no, like, you're talking about the the um, a master filmmaker who made right. three masterpieces and you didn't like any of them. Right. And now you want to watch an Amazon 
series about a the billion same world. dollar Amazon series. So what? Who cares how much the the cost? What if I the mean, new filmmaker? What if the new showrunners are are terrific? What if they? Well, Peter Jackson is terrific. You saw the Hobbit. All three of them. But, but hey, wait, I, James I, Cameron I, made Avatar. I don't. I don't understand. You you don't like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> It makes no sense. And Lord saying. of the but, Rings is as good as Lord of the Rings will ever but be. Jake, but Jake, this is the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. Rings the Rings of power. power. But listen, one of the things that's most annoying about the Lord of the Rings are the Hobbits. So uh, if this show does not have Hobbits... Oh my God, you are the Hobbits of Real Blend. I, all the other things are more exciting. Like, Sean, I don't, what you're yeah. saying makes no sense. <laughs> you, don't like the, you don't like the thought of a second breakfast? That's that. That's like that's like me watching. Is like, that a joke like from the, the franchise? The Hobbits movies. eat a second breakfast. That's like yeah. me watching the best Marvel movies. Yeah, and then being like, I don't know, that's not really my thing. But Hawkeye, though, I'm yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, Jake's like, I hated Infinity War and Endgame and Civil oh, War and Winter yeah. Soldier, but I can't wait for Hawkeye. <laughs> Give me some of that Hawkeye action because of Vera Farmiga. <laughs> <laughs> Are the Marvel equivalents to Hobbits uh, the Agents of Shield? Yes, they, they would the be. In the I think movie? that would be very fair. Aww. Yes. Yeah. What? Who's Gandalf? Uh, Downey. Probably Downey. I yeah. mean, technically, there's only one wizard. It, well, yeah, but I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> all right. Uh, there's two movies that are opening this week, and we haven't seen either of them, so we'll mention them We're briefly. Movie podcast. Yeah. Well, there. You know, you got to get them in front of us. Uh, one is called Redeeming Love. I think is on Netflix. And the other is called The King's Daughter, which is not a Matthew Vaughn spinoff to the King's Man franchise. Uh, you can find both of them <laughs> this week out there. Okay, so speaking of directors who have taken charge of a franchise that we love, this is part of why I was mentioning this with Amazon and The Lord of the Rings is that every once in a while you get a filmmaking team who comes around and, and dives back into a property that we enjoy and lets us see it from a different perspective, uh, the way that the Radio Silence guys did with Scream, uh, and so without further ado, I want to throw it right to our listen. Very, 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 very spoiler-filled conversation uh, with Matt and Tyler, the co-directors of Scream, and their producer Chad, who joins them as well too. They go by Radio Silence. Uh, they're great guys who came on the show to talk about the movie. They said they would come back and talk spoilers, and uh, held on to that promise. They did. And this is a great, great conversation. You guys are gonna love this one. Uh, it's the guys from Radio Silence on Real Blood. First of all, welcome back to Real Blend. It's an honor to have all of you back on the show. Obviously, congratulations on your incredible number one opening weekend. I mean, dethroning Spider-Man. I mean, it's 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 a huge deal. And obviously, it's great to see the power of this franchise still living all these years later. I know Wes Craven. I don't know him, but I feel like he'd be very proud to see this film uh, still going. Uh, and I know uh, his work will live on forever, even after his passing. So it's nice to talk to you guys about this incredible project. Um, but real fast, just to get a timestamp from you guys as to where we are right now. We're talking to you on Wednesday after your film came out. You're number one in the, in the country uh, right now. Can you talk about kind of what that feels like uh, and what, the success of it and the critical reaction to it and what the fans have been saying to you guys. I I mean, I think it's, I think it's better than any of us expected. You know, I think our job is to fall yes. in love, is to fall in love with something it, it, at the early stage. And then you hopefully keep as much of, of the thing that you love about it present throughout the process. And you, you know, your job is to kind of protect all of those things and, and make sure as many of them ultimately make it to the final product as you can. And so to, to be at the stage where people are seeing it and responding and, and that they, and that they, they understand it and that they love all of the tones that make a screen movie, a screen movie. I, I think, you know, speaking for us, the writers, the producers, I think we're all just, I think we're all just over the moon thrilled with it. Oh, That's awesome. Um, guys, so obviously we get the opportunity to uh, to dive into spoilers with you guys, which uh, we really wanted to last time, but we held back. But now we're gonna go. We're jumping into the deep into the pool. Um, Let's so do I'm it. Gonna, yeah, I'm, so I'm gonna start off with a with a with a big one. Um, there were a lot of fans, myself included, who really thought that the killer could be one of, if not multiple, of the legacy characters. Talking, uh, you know, uh, Sydney or or uh, or Gail or Dewey. I thought it was going to be Sydney. I don't know. Really? People really? thought it was going to be Sydney, right. yeah. Oh, and I'm okay. curious yeah. as to, you know, you guys are obviously, you're you're deep in the, in the world of Scream, but you're also fans. Um, do you think that the legacy killers should be or ever could be the killers of a Scream movie? 
That that's insanely interesting, and I, I've like n- never really actually went down that path as to how 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 this does affect them, right? Because they've obviously been through more trauma than any normal human being goes through in an entire life. So they definitely have grudges um, out there that they could possibly go down that with. But uh, but to me, n- no, I like you know honestly, there are heroes. There are there there are people who. They, they kill for good, if that is a thing. <laughs> and when they do kill somebody, they, they give the people their comeuppance. Um, Sid's body uh, count is pretty high. Just to- <laughs> I, know, it's pretty sick. I mean, like, honestly, like, yeah, Gale's too is pretty, very, very high. But if I were to go, I would probably go Gale first and then Sydney, because I don't think Sydney would really have it in her. Gale, like, if you really dig deep down it's a little Chad bit, fan you fiction might find right now. Yeah. <laughs> get, get, get to the message board quick, Chad. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I don't know. But, but besides that, that, it's such a, like, a far-reaching thought that I, yeah, no. I don't know, but I love that you guys asked that question, because I think what that, what that, shows us and we that i that i love so dearly is that you expect the movie to take a risk right mm-hmm. and that yeah. that is what is like it, it is intrinsic to the experience of watching one of these movies that the, the second you have an expectation you also have to assume that the movie is aware <laughs> of that expectation and is going to fuck with it in some in some way and 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 also just like i i, I love that you that you want the entertainment to do that thing right and specifically a screen movie it's gotta it's gotta be willing to it's gotta be willing to go to a place that is maybe a little uncomfortable and difficult yeah. and the only- I, well, hopefully we achieve that in some different ways but mm-hmm. that's a that's a really interesting question <clears throat> it's funny the only reason i ever thought it might, might be sydney just uh, piggybacking off of jake is if you go back to scream one they're in that bathroom with the two girls talking about why Sydney would be the killer. And I was like, that'd be a really cool thing. And like, like you said, like the trauma all over these years and that would ended up being, um, but I'm glad it wasn't, but to, to Jake's point, that's kind of what we were talking about on, in our text threads. So, well, and I want to sort of piggyback off of that too, because you guys talk about uh, the movie being willing to take risks or, or our set, set our expectations. And I think the movie does that really early on when Jenna's character survives the opening scene. Right. Um, and I want you guys to be able to talk about awesome. the significance of that, because once she survived, I, th- I think that's when I realized, oh, anything can happen here. Uh, and and we're really not playing by the rules. I mean, that that's exactly, that was in the script. All credit to Guy and Jamie for that. That was in the script. And we had wow. the exact same experience you had. When we got to that on page 12 or whatever, it was like, oh, great. All bets are off. I don't know what's going to happen now. And, and, you know, for us, it was a great inversion of the Drew Barrymore scene where you like get so attached and you're like, there's no way she's going to die. And then she does. And also on a very selfish note, we cast Jenna Ortega, who's one of the greatest actors that's alive. Right. So yeah. we now hopefully get to work with her again on another screen movie. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it was Guy and Jamie really understanding that in order for Scream to work and Tyler, you were just alluding to this scream needs to take chances it needs to take risks and it needs to play with your expectations so that it can subvert them and that's the first time in this movie that it really does that right Mm -hmm. and i mean yeah we had the same reaction but honest question for all three of you did any of you know that she was going to survive even a little bit or was it no 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 no, totally shocked halfway through the scene i did look at my wife and say what if she survives this how cool would that be that's that's all i said love it that's all i know because i remember that is like and I think the kind of crazy thing is that, you know, for us, because I, I, we had a fear in reading it that, oh, is Ghostface going to feel like like he's ineffective, right? That he's not as brutal and scary. And then you get to the moment where the big reveal happens. You go, fuck, it's all, it's all part of a plan. Like, it's all by design. And we loved that that was so that our killers were that had that level of manipulation. They were that meta in the story of the <laughs> of the movie. That for us was just like we, we were so hooked. They knew where to stab her exactly right so oh. that she wouldn't actually die. <laughs> God. Right. And, and that led to one of the best scenes in the film, which is the wheelchair scene, which I still think is oh. one of the most, like I literally feel that pain in my body when she's like turning the wheels and I'm like, oh my God, you feel every yeah. piece of it. Um, I think the script says slowest escape in history or something yeah. like that. That was all they said. And we're like, all right, cool. like we really got to milk this one out. 
That's awesome. There was this like whole like there everyone the fans you know when we were gearing up to make this there was all there was this call of like do a chase scene do a chase scene and we were like fuck it all right we're gonna give you the craziest weirdest subversion of the chase scene you've ever seen. God, that was awesome. Um, this is gonna be a, like a two part question, but it's still within the same realm of the same question. So I, I want to talk about the art of killing a legacy character, obviously like Dewey. I mean. This sounds weird to say, but I feel like he gets a a great death scene. I know it sounds strange to say that, but like I feel like like when the line it's it's an honor. I'm like he got the greatest type of death scene that he deserved after being in this franchise for so long. Um, I wanted to ask you about that scene in particular. Did you have other ideas of how to kill him off? Was it always the two knives going in and up, up in the front and the back? And then later on in the film, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we understand that Mikey is the killer in that moment. Uh, it's not Jack, um, which I find interesting because the killer in that moment does look larger than Mikey. Very large. So, okay, so, <laughs> so can, can you guys talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I will, I get, I'll, I'll say that with, you know, with Dewey's death, I mean, it was something that we were, we were obviously heartbroken when we read the script. We also just had this feeling in our, in our guts that it was the right thing to do, right? That structurally the movie needs, it needs an engine at that point. Stakes. And it needs stakes at that right. point. And you have to get Sid back to Woodsboro. And that's, and that's the way to, that's the way to do it. Right. It's to call on, call on like the loss of, of, of that, of a legacy character and, and, but shooting it was, you know, there was definitely a level of reverence and respect. We understood going into it, how just the gravity of, of what that was on the page. It was always two blades. We wanted it to feel iconic. We also knew after stabbing Dewey so many times in the previous movies that it was going to take more. To, to take him out. We sort of loved that there's like the method of killing him, like you said, is also an expression of his invincibility and of his and of his heroism to a certain mm. extent. And and then I think at the end of the day, the other thing that we really loved about that sequence that was on the page, and, and I, I think we're really pleased with how it ultimately plays in the movie is, you know, there there's more to that scene than just like a brutal, cruel murder. It, Gail, Gail is a part of that scene, right? With the phone call and and that he kind of gets to say goodbye to her and connect with her in one final moment. And there's a little bit of hope at the end of his, at the end of his run, all of those, all of those ingredients, it, uh, thankfully hearing you say that it feels, it feels heroic and it feels grand yeah. and like the proper sort of send off for, for his, you know, for that character. That means, that means the world to us. We, we yeah. were hoping to achieve that and we love that, that that's present at all. Yeah. And then guys, and even, you want to talk about Amber? <laughs> well, I was going to jump into like just, just the production value around what was going on there real quick too, because like the, the shelving that Ghostface smashes through that, that he, he pops up out of is, is, is like the, these shelves of these like cuddly, soft, like stuffed animals, right? It, it is, it is I've got some here. That, is, that is Dewey. Um, and you know, that, that you love that. And then the only thing that remains in the shelves after is like a sign that's hanging there and it says, thank you. And it was like something like that, you know, the H is the H oh, fell wow. off of one of the banners, but it's it's just like, you know, getting in all of those layers to make sure that we respect respectfully send Dewey off. Hmm. Amber is go ahead, Matt. You can go ahead. Yeah. I'm Mikey. curious about this. <laughs> it's a movie, guys. It's fucking fun. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> judgment. You know, we were just we were so, just curious. No, this is really fun. This I, I I joking aside, this is actually really fun to talk about because it's something that we stepping into this we're like how do you do that you know you and again if you look at ghostface ghostface is always ghostface right you have jill and you have matthew lillard mm. i don't know emma roberts but i assume she's not as tall as matthew lillard <laughs> uh and you know you and one of the things that i think ned said to us when we were kind of going because even when we were in pre-production we were debating like well what do we do how do we handle this and you know we had yeah, a little solved when we cast jack and amber and and mikey we were like this is, there is a disparity, yeah. height disparity yeah. between. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we kind of, we tried to make it seem like where you couldn't tell exactly what height everybody is. You know, obviously with Jack, that's a little hard because he's a <laughs> giant, but, uh, but it was, you know, Nev said something that really stuck with us is that she's like, you know, Ghostface, we, the way that they had always talked about is that Ghostface is, you, when you put on the Ghostface costume, you become Ghostface, not the other way around. That it's mm. almost like a oh, superhero, cool. you know? So she was like, you, you don't worry about it so much you know it's it's not about who's in it as much as it being ghost face and i think mm. for us that really gave us the leeway to be like okay cool we can just accept that this is ghost face 
yes, we get it. We joked about it a lot. Like, is there a way to even poke fun at it? Which that line didn't make it in the movie, right? We had a line where when Jack's in the kitchen, he's ranting about the problems. He was like, and the killers are all different heights. And it was just, it felt like a little. <laughs> yeah, no, it didn't make I it actually in. think yeah. it's funny. <laughs> it is funny. I, I There's a lot of shit in that like, scene that is very funny. That just didn't make it for, you know, pacing issues. But that, that's, yeah. that kitchen sequence is like cut in half just for, you know, you have to keep it on the rails. But there's a lot of great little moments there's, like, that, yeah. like that. Oh, that's cool. awesome. Thank um, you for so answering that. A, we were, uh, it, it, honestly, it was just, we were just thinking about it. it was, we thought it was cur- we were curious. So no, and fun fact that both the uh, the actual the two stuntmen we had two stuntmen who played Ghostface throughout the whole movie, and they're both five ten. Oh, just like oh, right no, in the that's middle. That's my height. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right, in, right, exactly, right in the middle. <laughs> that's my height. I'm Ghostface sized. Um, so I, I have a bit of a, of a nerdy question for you. Um, and, and it's regards to, to Sam's family. And obviously her father is, is Billy Loomis. Um, one is Sam, is Sam aware that her grandmother is uh, a serial killer as well? Um, and was there ever talks of like maybe her seeing Lori Metcalf? And then also who is Sam's mother? Because in theory, it would potentially be someone who they were going to high school with at the time. And there is a fan theory floating around that it's the second girl in the bathroom um, who is jealous of uh, of of Sydney and says something about That's like oh cool. it's like Sydney it's like like her she has her own bubble butt boyfriend or something like that. A lot of people think that that could be Sam's mom. Love that fan theory. Yeah, <laughs> confirm Steer into it. I saw one too about that it could be the two girls or one of the two girls at uh, the video store that Billy's talking to and Matthew Lillard and Jamie Kenner oh. had my conversation. All oh. interesting. Oh, yeah, I mean, God. I think we love the idea that there's still that there's an off screen story with with Sam's family. At the end of the day, we just it, we felt like the more we kind of let air into into the sister story, the less the movie was about the two sisters. So, mm-hmm. you know, we ultimately ended up just really focusing, focusing things in on the on the two of them. I also remember there were there were the, the month Christina Carpenter, the mom was in the script. Um, to a, to a slightly larger degree in a, in one of the drafts. She had a scene. And it felt like she was, it felt like her character was the cell phone in the horror movie that kind of made all of the stuff sort of harder to make scary and make tense. Mm-hmm. Like having a character that could kind of come in at any moment. It just was, it always felt like it was, it was an obstacle that wasn't enhancing ultimately the story between those, between those, those two, those two characters. Um, but we love that there's, we love that there's more, we love that there's more of that, family life that exists and that is honestly i mean there's there is there are ingredients to play with in that that we think could be really fun moving forward right what well, and not, like, not unlike calling out the height of the killers in the kitchen scene we did have a line where where richie richie's character was like your your father and your grandmother were serial killers and and he and said that sydney was another... killed your sydney killed your father and your, grandma. and your yeah, yeah. And your grandmother. Yeah. But we, we, we took that out just to really focus it in on, on the Billy of it all nice. and oh. for clarity for everybody. Cause then okay. people would be like, if people weren't Who's familiar the with Scream 2, yeah. <laughs> they're like, what the? I'm sorry, there's a the grandma, grandma serial killer yeah. in this movie. Well, yeah. but that's a perfect transition because I'm pretty sure you guys have a line in the script too, that calls Billy and Stu the, the first killers or the starters of this. Did you deliberately remove Roman? Is Roman Bridger out of out of this continuity, where is Scream 3 in all this? It's a really solid question. It's a really, really solid, it's funny you bring that up because I was literally watching Scream 3 a couple nights ago and I was like, <laughs> does this count? And I, I don't know, guys jump in, but I feel like in Scream, in, in the Screams that we all know and love, Billy and Stu started this, you know, right, yes. that, yes. that, and again, it's weird that we're making a requel that has retcon stuff happening in it and which it feels kind of like what roman was right it was this thing that happened before that nobody knew about yeah but i do think you may have just figured out the one thing that we on purpose or not just kind of ignored oh, right? and, I'm, yeah. and i'm okay with it well, I, I think part of it okay too is it. just that like the start of the saga for all of us you know as as as, as fans and is so specific to those two to those two killers. Hmm. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, uh, so I was sitting next Justice to my wife. Justice for during... Roman. We are not Roman deniers. Yeah, we love Roman, by but the way. Roman is a part, as much Justice a part of this as anybody. Roman. There's a hashtag right <laughs> now. Justice for Roman. Justice for Roman. 
Um, one of the things I found interesting um, as I was watching the film, I mean, it's it's obviously hard not to think about Arquette and Cox's real life relationship in the sense that the characters are talking as if they've broken up and they're in scenes together. But then I read somewhere that the photos that were used in the movie of their relationship were actual photos of their real relationship. So that just made me understand that they were just cool with dealing with that situation as part of the story. And obviously that's kind of what happened in the world of the story. Is that a touchy thing to mess with? Like, do you go to them and say, like, you know, we're going to play with this idea. Your characters are going through this. You know, we're going to have photos of your or did they offer up their own photos? I'm not, I'm not trying to ask like a TMZ type question. I'm just actually just genuinely <laughs> curious about how that was handled, because it does. Some of the lines hit close because, you know, they were together. I Yeah, I mean, look, we, we reached out. And, and it, certainly with the, with all the sensitivity that you would expect, you know, yeah. uh, reaching into a, a decades long relationship that started with these movies. So we were, we were very sensitive and very aware of, of just how personal that connection is on screen and, and off screen. And they were so game. They are, they are dear, dear friends. They really genuinely, genuinely love each other. And I think they also understood um, on a, not only just a personal kind of character level, how valuable it was to excavate that, you know, on, on screen, but I also think they understand the weird meta value of their relationship, how it's, how it's tracked with these movies. And then this one being, you know, being what it is and, and them kind of dealing with the, the past four, four movies and where they're sort of at in their lives and have they grown apart? Are they close? And there's real love there, but it's, it was all very, very much a part of that scene. And I remember in, in shooting, shooting that scene, it was there were a couple of takes right at the beginning where they were very clearly like after we cut cameras and they were like that one was for us like that one was for us having mm -hmm. having the experience together on set oh, wow. as you know as characters whose lives are a reflection you know are reflected in in this in this script and in this movie we're going to get it to a place but like it's going to it's going to take up it's going to be a process to like get get to that moment and it was I, i'll never forget that day guys we were all sitting around the monitors just like crying and like holy fuck like what a moment what a what a wild thing to get to see wow. happen you know on screen they really they really yeah. brought it all they yeah, yeah it was it was incredibly personal they were so generous with us like that like so did you wrap david on on his death was that his last scene or did he shoot that earlier in the process on the scene day. we were just talking about actually was his last oh was it okay yeah yeah gotcha uh, I want to talk about bringing Skeet back, which was a surprise. Like, I think my jaw dropped. It, my jaw still might be in the theater whenever I saw it. Like, I just never something. One, well, I thought it looked fantastic. Uh, I just want to talk about sort of the conversation of getting him on the phone and explaining, hey, th this character that died 25 years ago, we're going to need you to play this guy again, and we're going to need you to look like you did in high school. Um, and just how perfectly you guys... That part was easy, because he's incredibly good-looking. That's true. That's, that's true. true. That's true. That's true. Exactly you nailed that 90s same. hair again. Like, and the like shirt, the, the blood, the stains, everything. everything looks the same. Just like the process of, of doing that and, and how excited I'm assuming he was to, to bring Billy back, something I'm assuming he never thought he was going to get to do again. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think Skeet's jaw dropped, too, when we, he got the phone call saying, hey, do you want to be in scream um and he's like wait a second what year is this what's happening what's going on um but uh getting him to set was uh, was like uh, you know just very very special like we we shot with him for one day and it was their very last day of production um so so we did the green screen stuff and everything like that too but even just getting him to look that way in a, for a certain moment for one day he said it was the first time he actually went fully shaved in three years or something like so very clean shaved first time in three years and we looked at him and we're like oh my gosh you you look just like billy it's like this is amazing and and then the process for his hair too um skeet's natural hair is a little bit curly and he does there you go and oh it doesn't really that's run. so cool that's amazing <laughs> that's so cool really great. Oh. <laughs> um so we had to go into the into the hair and makeup trailer for about an hour to get his hair straightened as well and and by the time he came back to set we're like oh gosh you know let's get the blood on the shirt let's get everything going and let's let's really make make that look you know materialize because we did talk about a couple different ways that we could like see him in sam's visions right like what is her memories of him obviously she's never met him so so we decided to go with like crime scene photos. That's, that would be how she would imagine her dad because that would be all that she kind of did see 
of him or like that was the most influential. No pictures were taken of Billy Lewis. Of him. <laughs> it was the 90s. Right, yes. But then we used the, was the, the, the one. We used the glamour shot from the, the movie in, in the uh, in the Mindy Mindy speech scene where where he is he's looking pretty g- nice and he's glowing like a, a vampire from nice. Twilight. It's, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty a pretty great photo. We did shoot a bunch of crime um, scene photos though where we dressed we like redressed the the house in the yeah. aftermath of Billy and Stu's death. Cause they were originally gonna appear on the screen in the Mindy monologue scene. There were gonna be crime scene photos of the original house. And that was a particularly fucking crazy meta moment where we were, Billy, you know, Skeet was on the ground in the hallway. We dressed it props exactly where they are at the end of the movie, feathers everywhere from him, you know, stabbing, yeah. tearing open the couch. And it was like such a weird, time capsule to have what? 25 years later the actor that you know is billy there it, it was just so so wild and crazy please he tell also me you use corn syrup <laughs> 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 but you know what you know what we did do is that you know we went around and we threw all the the pillow feathers everywhere but he said he told us that he did that on the first take just kind of it wasn't like a direction it wasn't in the script he just did it and then apparently Wes Craven was like, I love it. And then Skeet was like, shit, now I have to do this every time. And I'm covered <laughs> in feathers for the rest of the movie. <laughs> um, all right. So in our last uh, conversation, you guys dropped a bombshell on us and we cut it out of the interview. And it was the um, audio cameos of, of everybody who died in a scream, uh, the toast uh, to Wes. So I would love now for you guys to elaborate yes. on whose idea it was and how you even go about doing it. Do you actually like, how long does it take to reach out to each of the different people and have them record this cameo? Cause it's a tremendous idea. Thank you. I mean, it was, it, we had the idea in post, I believe. Pretty early in post. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, because you know, the idea that was baked into the script, which was fantastic was like, let's have a party literally for Wes in the movie, you know, okay. and have a toast to Wes in the movie which of course if someone watches the movie not knowing who Wes Craven is they might not not, it'll still just go right over their heads but like we Mm. thought it was so special and so when we got to post and we started doing ADR we were like let's just get everybody so we called and or reached out to people through friends who knew people a in a pretty extensive list yeah Uh, and and had that and a lot of those people did other little voice cameos for us too but the in the four West one it was it's like almost the entire original cast including Henry Winkler, all of our cast. Who are some other fun ones? Julie Pleck. Julie Pleck. Um, Julie Pleck. Obviously, uh, Patrick Moussier. I like his Lucier. widow is in, is in it. Um, yeah, we had uh, Adam Brody and, and Hayden. From oh, wow. Florida. Adam wow. Brody yeah. and Hayden. I'm peeking at our list, guys. Vamp for a second. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, I will also say the other, uh, when you're reaching out to those people, you know, you also... We offered uh, we offered the opportunity to do some other voice cameo stuff, and you know, like Drew Drew is the voice of the principal when we're booming down at the high school. Uh, Matthew Lillard is the voice of Flamethrower Ghostface and has a line at the house party at the end. Jamie Kennedy is does the line. Some goof, someone's goofy ass dad is kicking us out. <laughs> we, we also wanted them to be as much like a part of a part of the movie as as possible and and they were so down i mean it was like I, we had no problem getting any of them everybody got back to us yeah, right and, i mean matt lillard's line at the house was cool house freeman which was nice because it was his <laughs> house in the original <laughs> oh that's awesome <laughs> that was a really early idea too that was another one of those a lot of like right. the, like the flamethrower ghost face that was like an early like in joke with us and guy and jamie being like ah that'd be really funny the fact that it actually happened and now exists is very <laughs> weird. <laughs> um, to Sean's oh, question, Mar- Marco about Beltrami fast- was another one. Just to oh, get out there. <clears throat> That's Beltrami's awesome. in there. That's awesome. Um, um, before I get to my question, just uh, follow up on what something Sean just asked. Like when you had them all recorded, did they all do it from home or something and just text it to you guys? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Technology. Yep. And then you have an amazing sound team that like builds, you know, builds it, puts it in the world and makes it sound incredible that's insane i literally figured when when you guys told us about the toast i was like i back i backpedaled and i was like they created that character named wes just so they could kill him <laughs> off to have a party to have the toast to have the cat i think <laughs> i think you're kind of right i mean that's true 
Um, last time, so going off of uh, what Sean was just saying, last time we talked to you, uh, you guys dropped that bombshell. And then as we were hanging up, I asked you a quick question and I wanted to like expand on it because uh, I think you guys remember now, but one of my favorite movies ever is Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, and it's it's hard not to think about Mikey's death being <laughs> coincidentally the same considering she's torched <laughs> just like their character was in Hollywood. Now, I know you guys told us um, at that point that it was not an homage, but I guess in the idea of Scream, you could think of it as an homage because it's the word torch. and like. But, you know, that character is interesting. So uh, when you guys were filming it, did you know... You had seen Hollywood, I'm imagining at that oh, yeah. point. Meaning, was yeah. it, was it brought times. up on set? Like, how, <laughs> was, did Mikey go, hey guys, this is kind of similar to how DiCaprio kills me in um, yeah. Hollywood? I mean, we knew it when we cast her, that it was, and, yeah. and we even we even had the conversation, we were like, is this weird? And then ultimately decided that even if even if you read it as as homage, it still works in the it's universe fun. of, of yeah. Scream. Like it still is just a fun, it's a fun texture that is, that is a reference to a movie that we love, love, love dearly and also really love Mikey in. And um, and it's also for us just, I think, a hilarious story that Mikey has now done to me. <laughs> <laughs> she, dies by, she dies by by fire and bug. <laughs> but Sydney's line of enjoy that torch is such a it's a first a tremendous delivery you know yeah. but it also says so much to this idea of these legacy characters you know and the notion that they have to pass the baton to another generation it's it's a great that's, great line that's yeah guy and jamie that was like one of those ones again like when we're reading it for the first time you get to that moment and you go oh fuck, you guys have outdone yourselves <laughs> that's great <laughs> And it's such a movie line. It's a line that like, yes. it's one of those that you would never say in real life, but as a character in a movie that's about movies, it like just fits. It's one of those, yeah. it, the context of it is just, is, is perfect. Well, Sydney's that, that had a lot of opportunities. Circles, it circles back to the thing we were talking to earlier about Amber. It's like, part of what makes Scream so wonderful is that you're aware that you're watching a movie that is aware of movies and knows movies and loves movies as much as we all do. So the things like when we were talking about Amber being, you know, after killing Dewey, like those things, you're like, yeah, that's a part of movies and that's fun. And that's part of the love letter. You know, it's like, it's just, I think it's what we love about Scream so much and why I think so many people, one of the million reasons people are so connected to the Scream franchise. And so to have that conversation, like what you're talking about, it's just, it's just awesome. It just kind of keeps going. Hmm. It's really fun. Yeah, and I remember um, just to talk, talking about Mikey a little bit more, like her coming in covered in a shroud so the first time we got to see the makeup of after the after effect of when she was on fire. Oh, and first great. of all, she was like, I can't believe I'm doing this again, which was like the first <laughs> thing she said. Um, the second thing we were able to do was like, look at like the design of the makeup that the, that our special effects makeup team did for her. And they gave her a Freddy Krueger ear as in one more nod to, yeah. to Wes. Um, so it's Rick the Poor, exact Rick same. Poor, shout out. Yeah, oh. copy to a Freddy yeah. Krueger ear on it's the, the one thing head. you wish was on screen more like that right. appliance that they put on her is oh my god like oh my movie. god that's that's yeah, that yes. might be my favorite yes. easter egg that I've heard <laughs> so far I wanted, wow. to, I wanted to ask about oh non-scream Wes easter eggs oh, you guys might have so worked much. in there there's a lot are there's there really so many yeah yeah is there's that the best so, one the Freddy ear Gallner's I mean, tattoo on his knuckles. He has the the address of the Elm Street house on his knuckles. Um, who, who does? Kyle Gallner, Vince, Vince, Vince the character. Oh, okay. you, really, okay. you see him just very briefly, but um, I'm trying to think of other. There's it's all the marquee, the marquee the behind yeah. on behind uh, Mindy. Oh, the marquee is all Wes Craven movies. Okay. Uh, behind behind Mindy when she's on the couch is people under the stairs, which is also behind Randy when he's on the couch. Okay. In both of those. <laughs> the amount um, of birds we have in sound design, that was like, obviously yeah, there's what's crazy a massive, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. A massive bird watcher and a big fan of, of birds. Oh. So every, like we, our sound designer, Karen Baker Landers, she, she, she found out all these different specific birds that he was fans of and they're sprinkled throughout the entire movie. And, oh. and I think you could really hear them at the very end on the four west dedication that's well amazing. that's a very specific bird at the end that was the bird that's that reminded bell. him of ohio that was yeah, yeah that right. was the one that he said in an interview yeah. reminded him of when he was a kid 
Oh, wow. Oh my you God. guys are, you guys just crushed. You did your that's research. Insane. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> it's oh. fun though, right? That's, that's like what's so fun about building a, a universe within the Scream movie uh, is it, you can do all of that stuff, right? It's mm. okay. And it's okay for people to notice it. It doesn't break, it doesn't break the fourth wall. It just lets them in, in, in into the conversation in a totally new and self-reflexive way. I, it's going to be hard to make something now that doesn't get to have that level of conversation with the audience because it's just been so, it's been guys, so fun and there's so many opportunities to have, you know, to, to make things matter. You guys really need to do a commentary track that people can listen to now in the theaters. Though. Yes. Because I would, I, I can imagine you guys want to be sitting behind people, you know, while they're watching the movie, like, <laughs> hey, that's, a, that. that's a Freddy Krueger <laughs> here. <laughs> I would be totally down for like a Mystery Science 3000 thing where you guys just in the front yeah, yeah, yeah. pointing things out. I would totally be down for that. Um, I, I had heard a story, uh, I think when you guys were in the middle of production, that in order to sort of preserve the ending that you guys were shooting multiple endings with different killers or that there was a going to be different variations of the script floating around. And I feel like I've heard that for some of the past screams as well. Uh, I'm just sort of curious, did, were there different versions of scripts with different killers and does everyone on set sort of have a different idea as to who the killer is? I, I would say it's, it's, it's more from withholding. Um, like when we initially sent the script out, like before people would sign on, we only sent them the first three quarters of the script and we didn't, we kept act three to ourselves. Um, and, and then as we went into production, we're like, we need to let everybody prepare. And we kind of, we really built a really close knit family of everybody. And honestly, every cast member was, was excited for, for part of the game for a little bit as we got into it. Um, like the different meetings we'd have with different actors, like they wouldn't want to be seen in the elevator with us going up because they thought we might be conspiring and they didn't <laughs> want another cast member to see it. Everybody was like, all, all, all for the fun of that. Um, but when it comes to actually shooting multiple scenes, we, we, we didn't have that luxury. Um, so it was more of just seeding out the different, the different script endings and changing the killers um, from what we sent out around town. And Guys, different Jack, versions Jack of the Quaid, like literally up until the moment we were shooting, wasn't sure if we were fucking with him or not. It was Zach. <laughs> he, he, he is the one that we, I think we kind of kept doing the pivot with more than anybody because oh, yeah. he was an easy target for it. But <laughs> do, <laughs> do we, do we says it? you found, oh, what, what, what character says like we told you in the first 10 minutes, like uh, right at the end, like, like that, that is exactly what you oh, guys yeah. did. Yeah, do we got it in one? We <laughs> <laughs> got it in one. It's like a love injury. <laughs> and he calls him stupid. Right. He calls her dude. He calls Sam dude. dude. <laughs> <It's stupid. laughs> yeah. What a douche. <laughs> the worst. Uh, uh, the my, yeah. I think we have time to fit in uh, two two more. Mine's really quick. Um, Sydney mentions her husband, Mark. Is it Mark Kincaid? And did you try to get Patrick Dempsey back? It is Mark and Kate, but we didn't try to get that. We didn't want to go into that whole other thing, but it is, it is Sydney married Mark and Kate. Gotcha. Very cool. Kevin, it's I figured so, you had the last one. Yeah. yeah, it's just so it's just so funny. Um, before I get to the question, like, because the, the the way you guys play with us is so interesting in the movie. Because like you think it's Quaid right in the first ten minutes in that scene, and then you you pivot us so much. I felt like a ping pong ball going back and forth, and then and then you and that's the brilliance of the film. It's always a step ahead. Like even when like Dewey starts walking towards the elevator, you're like, dude, go back and shoot him in the head. And like you like, and then the movie goes. Oh wait, we should do that. And then they go back. It's so it's so cool how you guys play with that. Um, I know we're talking on the the week after your film opened up. It's number one. And a question that we all talk about in interviews now is sequels and who, what are you doing next. And I I wonder this because emotionally, I told you guys this when I watched this film when I was twelve when I walked out of that theater for the first movie in ninety six. This was the closest I'd felt to that experience again in the sense of like the excitement and the horror and the intensity and just how game changing it was. And just like, that's how I felt. And you guys have really made a perfect scream film, a film that really honors the legacy of what Wes created in the first one. I'm not just saying that to blow smoke. I just genuinely believe it was just, uh, it, it reminded me of being a kid again. Um, so I wanted to ask you, would you want to do six knowing how like well received this was like would six be a uh, a more of a battle or would you be worried about it are you guys are you guys game for six because like this movie just like it's called scream it bookends the first one so i just wonder where you guys want to yeah. go we either want to do six or the first stab movie that actually is the whole way through yeah no. we want to go to space we want to get okay. yeah, okay. into yeah. outer space and then we want to we'll drop off <laughs> go spacex do you guys like go to do six X. for real though I think we'd yeah, be honored yeah. to be a part of it. 
And I think the thing that we've sort of realized with this one, and I we, we knew it to be true, but I think, you know, and certainly like as conversation about the movie is, is it, it has started and, you know, people are expressing their opinions and, and, you know, debating the themes. I think what we're realizing is that the fun of, of any of these movies is that you get to use all of it, right? Like everything that we're experiencing, everything we experienced on this one, everything that is going to happen in its aftermath, it's all... Uh, it's all, it's all like part of the fabric of what maybe the next one could be. So, so yeah, I think that there's certainly like, all on Zoom. Is it? how Space do you subvert six. Zoom? <laughs> yeah, how do you subvert the thing that's now subverted? It, it, it has folded in on itself so many times. And I think for us, that's just exciting. Like that feels like an opportunity to do something just even more, you know, kind of brain, <laughs> brain breaking. And what's and our last Jedi? What's our last Jedi? You guys don't have to uh, take this idea, but um, it's one of our favorite stories of all time. James Cameron, when he pitched Aliens, and he uh, he wrote the word alien on a board, and then he put an S at the end of it, and then he put dollar signs through it. So if you guys want to make screams uh, with a dollar sign, just... Uh, I mean, that worked out pretty well for him, so... It's free. Right. It's free. You guys have that one. So Take my money. I just, I just. <laughs> Get some aura weaving in Scream 6. Oh, oh, we would love to. We would love to. <laughs> well, um, first off, guys, thanks for coming back on so quickly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, our pleasure, I, guys. Thank I you. can't imagine how hard it is, you know, to do press for a movie like this uh, and to and to hold back uh, all this these. This is spoilers. like the most fun we're able to have so far because, like, we, we it's so hard not to talk about the movie. Like, sure, the, you know, the choices that we made. Now it's like, all right, cool. Now it's out there. Let, let's like get into it a little bit more and 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 put our stamp on it in a different way. Wow. Yeah, and I think especially when like the methodology and about the making of it is a part of what the story of these movies are, right? Yeah. I think that's what, if you're a fan of anything in this universe, you're also aware of all of the stories of how they got made. And, mm -hmm. and it's so that, that and having that be a part of the process and the thing that you can talk about and that there's interest around is really, is just really awesome and exciting for us. It also helps when the movie is great. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, we could, we could talk spoilers all day long for bad movies and, and I'm good. Like, it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And shout out to Brian Tyler, by the way, one of the, my favorite oh, composers right now. I mean, like, man. He, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. He had a hell he's, of a he's, he's made our last two movies really a lot better than a they had better. any right to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Brian. Great well, composer. thank you guys for coming back on. We really appreciate it. Hopefully get to talk to you guys again soon and uh, continued success. Congratulations again on a terrific opening weekend. Thanks, guys. Thank thank you. You. Thanks, Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate, appreciate it, guys. Thanks, guys. Have a good again. one. We want to thank our friends at Paramount uh, for giving us time with Matt and Tyler and Chad, and also to Matt, Tyler, and Chad for being tremendous guests uh, yeah. two weeks in a row. Loved having those guys on. Uh, loved diving deeper into Scream. I, so far, both times now we've had them on, they've blown my mind uh, with some type of reveal, yeah. and and this one has to be the Freddy Krueger ear. Like that's just uh, <laughs> one of the greatest <laughs> stories ever. But that, I guess. I, I said that in the interview and I really did mean that. Like when you're a director who puts in some sort of detail like that, that the general audience might not catch. Like, yeah. isn't that annoying? Don't you want to sit in the in the theater and, and like point it out to different people? Well, think about like Jordan Peele. Like I, I remember thinking about because Get Out is filled with so many little things that you don't pick up on the first time you watch it or the second time or the third time. And like, I remember talking to Jordan Peele for us. I kind of asked that question. I'm like, like, is there a certain level of restraint that you have as a filmmaker, knowing you have something brilliant that you're saying in a scene, but most people might not get it? Yeah. Like, you know, and like, and it, it is an interesting thing because to me, that's pure talent. Like, if you're able to, like, if you have a great idea, and then you can restrain yourself in a way that you, yeah, like ninety percent of the people who watch this movie are probably not going to see this or get this. Yeah. Um, but then you have people who dive in to get out like seven, eight times, like I have, and it's so rewarding. Um, but you're right, though, it is fascinating. Like if you think about someone watching the screen movie once and then never seeing it again and never knowing that Freddy Krueger's ear is on. I mean, Mikey's. we we never would have. I could have watched the movie a thousand no. times. There's no way I would have. And no. so, like, and that's called restraint. And and it, yeah. and it's it's and to me that's talent because you have a brilliant idea. If you think about all the things in Get Out that are like go, that go unsaid or like little details that he puts in there for multiple viewings, it's just it's just insane. It's yeah. insane. It, it's it's almost like um, when you buy someone a really great Christmas gift 
you have to wait like eight weeks to give it to them. Isn't there a part of you that's like, you just want to be like, yeah. oh, can I, just, can I just give it to you right now? Or can I just mm-hmm. tell you what I bought you? It's like, it's, it's just, it's, it's the worst. And then you give it to them and they're like, cool. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Nice. No, this is great. Thanks. Yeah. But it is thank crazy you. to think about when you put something like crazy. My, my, in my favorite movie, movie on VHS. Will. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I loved. I still have Dunkirk on VHS upstairs. Mine's my, up here. Mine's on the shelf somewhere over here. I see it every um, day. By the way, I gotta do a. I'm doing a deep dive clean of the office. Um, it's if I tilted the camera down, you guys would feel like I'm in a hoarder house. It's Let me really, see. Um, Let me see. You don't need. To, no, you no. don't need to tilt the camera down for us. To do <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of like the cleanest area. Also, Jason. Get... What's the guy's name from Tommy? Pam and Tommy. He's down there. <laughs> he might be down there right. with, his voice, with three assistants <laughs> moving it around uh, the blend game we are playing superhero theme blend and I'm starting with Kevin McCarthy to tell me what your favorite superhero theme is oh, I'm a controver- I, ooh, con- ooh, controversial I, 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 one can I guess you can guess if you want can I guess? yeah sure is yours uh, Zimmer's Man of Steel theme it is oh Damn. why is that controversial uh, it's a I terrific mean, you know, theme for- well, it's my, well, I think it's my favorite superhero theme of all time, and I, I think favorite. this is this is that's this the is, question. That's I say controversial question. because that movie is very divisive. Okay. Snyder is very divisive. Um, I could see somebody listening to this and screaming like, "How the hell could you not choose John Williams's <laughs> the you know theme from the first Superman?" So, like, I think you know, at the end of the day, I think this speaks generationally here. Mm-hmm. Um, as much as I admire. Uh, John Williams' theme for Superman. Uh, I have, I'm a fan of other John Williams' scores more than I am of his Superman theme. Um, Zimmer's theme for Superman, like, n- before we had Hunt, Hen Zimmer on our show, Z- Zimmer came on for Dune. If you haven't listened to that episode, go back and check oh, it out. It's okay. um, and it had always been my favorite <laughs> of, 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 of superhero themes. But then when Zimmer explained it, it just mm. opened it up even more. Like, there's a great part of that interview where he de- he talks about the choices that he uses you know why the sounds are the way they are um it's not but like it, it, it's not even just a single particular piece of music it's the whole theme it's the whole movie um like as the film gets more aggravated and more um intense that like that heavy drum style that like really really in your face like you know that's definitely a nolan style of using score like really like making it part of the world and environment and as a leading character not that people haven't done that before but nolan i feel like gets should get some credit for the way he's utilized zimmer over the years um mm-hmm. with the dark knight and obviously dunkirk and everything he's done um but man I'm stunned Steel, you didn't pick the dark knight actually i thought the dark knight theme was going to be the dark knight's a tough one because you can arguably say that the music was already written for batman begins mm-hmm. um and then like the that main like dun Dun, dun. Like, the, like mm-hmm. there's so many. I mean, and then you could argue the Joker's theme, the D note. I mean, those are great themes. No, don't get me wrong. No question. But like after I heard Man of Steel, I, it was over because like it was there was just something so full and heartfelt about that piece of music just in simple piano notes mm. um, and then using it for also the way Snyder shot Man of Steel. Like it was very documentary like if you watch that movie closely, the camera is always searching for Superman. Like if you watch like the camera, it's it's almost like moving in a way where it's like trying to help you find Superman in his quick flight, which I think is really a cool idea because he's so fast that like it probably would be impossible for someone to capture that. You know what I mean? And like and so for the music to combine with that and then the when he starts flying for the first time, like, you know, it just like ugh, it's. It's like it, to me, it's one of the greatest pieces of music ever written, not just superhero theme, but like it is just masterful. Um, and it just like makes me feel something. The music itself brings me to the world of the movie without the movie. And I think that's 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 the key to a great score. If you hear the Star Wars theme, you hear the Indiana Jones theme, you're immediately transported mm. to the world. You hear Howard Shore's Lord of the Rings theme, you're immediately transfor- uh, transported to the world. Um, when I hear Man of Steel, I'm in that world. I'm with Cavill. I'm feeling his his emotion and his and his and his and his insecurities and his vulnerabilities and his rage. Um, it's brilliant. Well, coincidentally, I went with the John Williams one. I know you did. <laughs> um, and and you might be right. Maybe it's just a generational thing. And and I will say that I have come a lot further into the Zimmer camp um, of how mm. fantastic that score. And only because mm. I was immersed in those movies. 
um, while writing the Snyder Cut book. And he, uh, like you said, hearing him talk about the breakdown of uh, the very simple piano to reflect his Kansas time um, mm. and and building to the to the use of drums. But I can't not like I, I've made the argument on this uh, show many times that the Superman theme is my choice for the best thing that the John Williams has done. And that's kind of crazy to say <laughs> that when you when you talk about the number of things that he has accomplished. But there's nothing more triumphant uh, than that score. It's mm. it's. You know, and and Zimmer even talks about this a little bit in the interview of like the challenge of writing a, a theme for a character as iconic as Superman. Um, and what I love about John Williams' score and and a lot of his earlier stuff, whether it's um, Indiana Jones or Star Wars or Superman, is that people paid or gave a lot more uh, credit to and attention to uh, a score in an earlier because people had themes you know i yeah. think we get we're, we're yeah. through a period now where characters signature characters don't necessarily come with uh iconic themes that you would in, in, immediately associate with them when you heard them uh and john That's williams why was, home was smart that. because you hear strange's theme come in like you know that like that picking yes. of the of the of the instrument like oh that's strange we're outside of the, I, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off but like they, no. they, they do that well I went back for <laughs> I went back for round four of No Way Home and it's it's as subtle as like mm -hmm. just any at the end of the in the third act when Ned opens a portal and Dr. Strange walks through it, Giacchino plays his mm -hmm. theme and it's just it puts you right back into it. Um, but as as a sort of aside to that, when Giacchino had to come up with a theme for uh, Homecoming, he riffs the 60s cartoon because of how prevalent themes were back in the day. So um, there's two big segments to uh the superman theme song there's the bah, 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 which yeah. is the, i mean again you hear it and, and you my it, god it make, i get goosebumps an and i want to yes i really do um and then there's a like they're both they're both just like you want to rip your shirt open and reveal the the s underneath or um it's it's it's, it's tremendous and so uh i ha had to had to go with that, and uh, but Kevin, I, I'm with you as well too. The the Zimmer, the Zimmer Man of Steel is fantastic. So Jakey, break the tie. Uh, who'd you go with? Uh, I think this blend game is one of the most. Uh, it's it's the blend game that uh, for the longest time in a while, I think that really relies on us differentiating favorite from best. Hmm. And because we're talking superheroes, which is obviously a big part of like us growing up, for me. Uh, it, my pick is all about like my childhood, so I chose Danny Elfman's Batman thing mm. because when I hear that theme, not even so much like oh it takes me back to those movies, Tim Burton's first two films, which is absolutely which it absolutely does. It takes me back to a different part of my life. Mm. Like I hear da na 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 na, and I remember like my parents taking me to McDonald's yeah. over and over again so I could try to collect all the Batman Returns Happy Meal toys. I remember you know. Uh, going to the video store to you know and convincing my please mom buy this buy batman for me on tape like because you know buying a tape you know it was a big deal back then <laughs> and so the you know it the it's it's one thing to hear music and have it associated with uh you know a, a character or a film but to have it have it transport you in time to a different place a different like memory of different time in your life uh i just think is incredibly powerful and that's what danny elfman's um, Batman theme does. I will say, hearing Zimmer score, particularly, you put it in your earpods and you walk around the city of Chicago. That's a pretty, that's a pretty cool feeling. Um, I've actually done that a couple of times. Um, but, but nothing, nothing does what Elfman's score for me. So that, so that's why I'm relying on really favorite. Um, if, if, if I had to choose best, I actually probably would choose William's Superman theme. Um, but, uh, but if we're going favorite, which is why I love this game, uh, then I'm going Elfman's Batman. And Elfman um, was on our show, by the way. If, you, if, any, if yes, have, he anyone hasn't heard that interview, he came on, uh, was it for Dumbo? Um, yes. Yes, I was. And he took a really deep dive in his career. We talked, pretty sure we talked Spider-Man. We talked uh, uh, Batman, I want to say, came up. I know Dark Man. Nightmare Before Christmas. Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, yeah. So if you're, if you're, if you never heard our Elfman interview, it's, he's, he it was a really cool to kind of like deep dive in his career, so. Kevin, um, I, just, I just wish you liked Nightmare Before Christmas. I just wish you would give it a shot. I don't know yeah. why you hate that movie so much. I don't I know. Try. I mean, I, 
I mean, I, honestly, if I ever get two dogs, I would name them Jack and Sally, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Janelle says either Danny Elfman's Batman or, good one, Michael Giacchino's The Incredibles. That's a really great yeah. theme. Mm. Uh, Jim McCann, Brian, and many others went with John Williams as Superman. Christian Williams said Shang-Chi uh, from Joel P. West. Oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, James Vasquez score. says Flight uh, from Man of Steel. And Jeff Maiman says... Uh, the DCU Wonder Woman theme also Hans oh, Zimmer, dun, which dun, is dun, Sean dun, dun, Pants dun, is incredible. Yes, what they that used was... it a lot in the Snyder Cut. Yeah, yeah a lot. that's like a good like oh, almost too much. Like 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 she sneezed nah. and then it'd be like. <laughs> I, now Zimmer and Junkie XL both get credit for that, right? That that's is that yeah is that Zimmer. Uh, no, it's Junkie. That's a lot of Junkie. Uh, well, no, okay. no, the Wonder Woman one is, is Zimmer with the guitar. Okay. The guitar riff, but then Junkie sort of built on it for Snyder Cut. I am surprised that, I, and Sean, I know how much you love Superman. I am surprised that no one picked Sylvester's Avengers theme. It's a great one. Because that yeah. is like, it's good. That, that is a great be, yeah, I thought about that one. That's pretty, like, iconic. I'd almost put, um, and I, if I remember correctly, it kind of shares some motifs with Avengers. Uh, Giacchino's Spider-Man. Yeah, I know. Above yeah. the Avengers, I think, for me, even. It's... It's hard because my only critique about the Marvel scores is that they're they're similar. Um, when I hear them, I know exactly it what like it is. It feels like they sh- they sh- they share a world together though, which I like. That's how I yeah. always do it. Like like the way Spider Man's is that when world I hear boring it boring themes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> when you All hear right. when you hear Spider Man, it evokes the Avengers, which is great because that's how he was brought in. Like it feels like he's a part of that world and that team. I like that. So for next week. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna gra- get a graceful one next week. We're gonna continue. Uh, we're gonna continue the meta, the meta conversation that's been sp- uh, sprung from the world of Scream and the and the deep dive references that's that the Scream directors worked into their franchise. Next week's blend game is hashtag Real Blend Blend, where you are going to for the two hundredth episode, you're gonna let us know uh, via hashtag Real Blend Real Blend Blend. Uh, or sending us an email at realblend at cinemablend.com. Your favorite Real Blend interview from the first 199. Question. Question. What if we yes, open sir. that up to the to the listeners to yeah. Real Blend moment? They can just share a story from, there's like great arguments. There's all kinds. What if we just. I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. Favorite Real Blend moment. Favorite, favorite Real, Real Blend, Blend moment. moment. Whether it's an interview or a discussion or. What the? All right. Well, I got to I got to binge. Real Blend Blend. Episode one. <laughs> <laughs> don't, no, please don't. Start around 60. That's when True. we started to True. figure out what we were doing. Um, while you are going back through the previous wow. 199 episodes wow. uh, and remembering <laughs> all the entertainment that we have brought you guys over the years, leave us a review, please. Uh, go over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. You can leave us a star rating on Spotify. Uh, we're going to be recording. recording our next premium episode we're playing the imdb game uh, once again despite the fact that i hate that game and i don't think there's any skill to it you don't uh, you hate get, the game you just hate losing the game which I you do, do hate losing the game it's very true yeah. you uh, probably hate a lot you can get access to oh and also people were sharing on the facebook uh chat page for real blend that they really enjoyed the the draft the 2022 Fantastic. movie draft and they were saying that if you want to listen to the movie draft conversation and all the other fun things that we do on premium go to cinemablend.com backslash real blend premium in the meantime follow oh shoot shoot i wanted to go back and listen to last week's episode because i came up with something that i was going to shout what am i going to shout at the end of this episode gabe I thought do you we remember had, i thought we had to say the batman because oh that's right thank anticipated. you thank you okay so yeah yes okay so you can uh follow us on social media uh, at jake's takes at kevin mccarthy tv at sean underscore o'connell at gabe kovach and the show is at real blend yes gabe and a final reminder, yes. next week, Friday, we are on Cinema Blend's Instagram. We are going live to celebrate episode 200, a fun little after party at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. Apologies um, if you are in a time zone that that's at a wild hour. We oh, love yeah. you all the same. Um, well, that's at like 11 UK, right? That's not too bad. Could be. I think that's right. Uh, we're worth zone. staying up for. We are absolutely worth staying because Jake's yes. going to get a tattoo. Come hang out. Come hang out. If it's fun, Finch. if people enjoy it and people want to keep Finch. doing it, maybe <laughs> maybe we'll do we'll do more of them. But but we'll see you guys next week for that. Anyway, until All next right. time. The Batman, Hubie, Hubie. <laughs> Jesus